Neil Criddle is an extraordinary accountant. I've just done an interview with him and he's, he's getting on towards £200,000 of annual fees, which is his target for his second year in practice. And he's on track for doing exactly that. And he's only just hired his first team member. He's, he's building an extraordinary accounting firm, doing some inc incredible stuff. Uh, and of course, pricing is right at the heart of what he's doing. So uh, I did this interview. I want to find out what he's doing, the sorts of results he's getting. So let's go and listen to, to Neil. We can learn so much about how to build a great accounting firm. So Neil, thank you so much for coming along and uh, letting me have a chat with you, a conversation with you, because you're doing some extraordinary things and you keep sharing the amazing things you're doing within the Value Pricing Academy. So I'd, I'd love to catch up, see what's been going on. And, but first, the first question, just for people who have no idea who you are, could you just say a little bit about uh, your background, how long you've been in practice, uh, where it's based, how you got to being in practice, because I know that's quite an interesting story as well. And then we'll start to get into what you what you did. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you. So, uh, yeah, my name's Neil. Um, I'm based in a small town called Western Supermare, which is about 25 minutes southwest of Bristol in the southwest of the UK. Um, I have a wife, two children, two cats, and a dog. That uh, are equally amazing and equally frustrating uh, at the same time. Um, I probably had about 12 years working in my career prior to starting my business and those 12 years were uh, well they, they were fully in industry so i've worked for kind of lots of large corporates and that's predominantly my background in a variety of industries including veterinary financial services construction um and a couple of other telecoms as well um i i've had no prior to starting my business i've had no prior accountancy practice or accountancy firm experience so what I think I, I wanted to do as I got further into my career is that I wanted to I wanted to help people, but kind of in my own way. Um, I'm not a massive fan of following the rules if I think the, the rules aren't really fit for purpose for the end user. So I was doing, you know, a lot of good work and um, getting frustrated by the fact that I couldn't help people in the way that I think that they would have benefited from being helped. Um, by political red tape and hierarchies, etc. So, I I started my business back in uh, January 2020 with kind of that being um, a sole mission, really. But uh, yeah, no, no prior accountancy practice experience before then. Yeah, and one of the things that's interesting is is that when I talk to other accountants, and when I think about my own story as well, when I started my firm back in '96, I. I made so many mistakes in the first three years and it wasn't until 99 I figured out and started to learn a better way of running an accounting practice. So I spent two or three years then fixing the mistakes and that's something I see over and over again that people have a huge amount of pain, particularly when it comes to pricing and pricing wrong. But you're a bit different, Neil, because uh, I, just uh, uh, very shortly after, and I forget how long you'll probably tell me and correct me, but very shortly after you started, you joined the Value Pricing Academy to start learning how to, to do things right from day day one so my question is um, why did you make that decision uh, and uh, and what was the journey journey like uh, kind of learning best practice and doing things different and, and better than what most people do when they start a, a brand new accounting firm yeah I mean I, I think I, I found about you mark probably via social media around the middle of 2019 and um, I jumped on board some of your your free webinars and content and I've seen you speaking at a couple of events as well and um, I just um, you know with, with my business being kind of a bit of a sideline and a, a bit of a pipe dream at that point I was kind of I had the mindset that said right well this is the guy that I, I need to really follow because you know he's talking about pricing and marketing you know two areas that I have no idea of um, were you know in, in terms of the the characteristics of an accountancy practice kind of technically I knew what I was doing but in terms of like I said before that experience I, I just didn't have so um, and that combined with the personality I, I thought you know th this guy is really super cool um, and so yeah when I lost my job in January 2020 
Um, and I, I made the decision that I was going to really attack this full time um, with no other household income. You know, I I was earning um, probably about twenty percent of my 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 previous jobs income. Um, not enough to pay the bills, not enough to pay the mortgage, to feed the family. So I thought, right, I've I've got to do this, and I've either got to fail fast or it's it's, it's got to work fast. I, I, either way, this this has to happen relatively quickly. Um, I think I had about two months worth of cash in the bank to live off. Um, so I, I kind of set myself a deadline by the end of March. And as part of that kind of decision making process, I was like, well, I've, I've got to join Mark's Academy. I've, I've got to get the content, the resources. I've got to go on all of these different webinars that he does. That's not just, you know, the, the free ones that you do once or twice a month. Um, and uh, it was it was an easy decision in terms of what I wanted to do and in terms of the strategy of the business, but in terms of cash flow and the short termism, it was probably the most difficult because, um, you know, without quoting figures, I think if it was probably, you know, 50, 50, 60% of my monthly recurring revenue at that point. So I thought, but you know, Mark's the guy, Mark, Mark's the guy. If I'm going to make this work, Mark is going to be kind of the, the partner in crime that I need by my side to kind of help me to learn these things. Um, and then when March happened, uh, and you know, the pandemic hit and the lockdown happened, um, I then had a kind of a second wave of, of doubt to say, well, if all my clients leave me, I'm not gonna have any revenue I'm gonna have to leave Mark's program. And that's, that's gonna be really upsetting for me. Um, you know, fortunately things didn't turn out that way, but I think in terms of that sort of January to March period, um, I mean, I think if from memory, it was probably like two weeks after I went full time that I signed. I signed up for, for your academy, Mark. Um, again, I think it was a, a free webinar that you did with with maybe a promotional offer or something. I, I can't quite remember. I'm 18 months ago. It seems seems about 18 years ago now. Um, but but in terms of kind of thinking about you know what what do I need to focus on in this business to make it work as quickly as possible? And the two things were marketing and pricing. Absolutely. Yeah, and one of the things we need to remember, is kind of, is, is that this is a very short space of time, as you said, 18, 18 months, uh, and and what you've done is extraordinary. Which we'll get into that. So, what were some of the things that you, what were some some of the things you started to actually put into place? So, what was your what was your approach to pricing, and what specific things did you do? Um, I, I think initially, um, I, I tried to kind of factor in a, a formalised proposal process, um, and that went right the way from you know, having uh, ideally two meetings with a with a with a with a lead with a new engagement. You know, the first meeting being um, the, the kind of the discovery meeting and figuring out exactly what they wanted, um, and then the second meeting being the one where I discussed the proposal in detail. Um, and you know, the, the proposals weren't massively scientific; they were <laughs> drawn up on a, a word document and then PDF and, and sent to the client. Um, but at that point, I was providing options as well and. Uh, I think one one of the things that I did do very very early on, um, probably even before joining um, your academy with, with a couple of clients that I won towards the end of twenty nineteen, was that I knew that I had to give options. Um, I didn't want to be kind of uh, anchored into to, to one price because I knew that that price would either be too cheap or too expensive. Um, I I definitely undersold work um, early on, which I think you know probably everyone does when they when they first start out to try and build up a bit, uh, a bit of a base. Um, but I think you know the, the the proposal process and the pricing by options and you know giving three different tiers of service um, that was that was very quickly something that I I integrated um, along with making these services clear for people. Um, you know, still to this day, I've I've got four key services which are accounting and tax, bookkeeping, payroll and business advisory. Um, and, you know, there's detail within those four services, but I've, I've kept it relatively simple um, and provided options based on those four services just to, um, like I said before, g give the client, you know, the, the option of, of both price and in terms of what mix of service that they want as well. Um, so that, that, that was the, the core thing um, back before I was using kind of, you know, technology for CRM systems and technology for proposals and payment mechanics and all that sort of thing. It was the old fashioned Word document into a PDF, but, but given those options. And, and if I could pick up on, on one thing that you, you said a little while ago, uh, is that when you were meeting with potential clients, 
Uh, if I got it right, you had a you you have a two meeting process. The first meeting is I, I, I presume is to ask questions, and then you have a second meeting to then present the proposal. Uh, as opposed to what a lot of people do is they they're lazy, take shortcuts, and just want to sign them up the client up as quick as possible in, in one meeting. So, so, what made you decide to do that particular approach, uh, and what sort of uh, and how's that going? What sort of res- results as a result of doing that? Um. I wouldn't say I have two meetings for every client. It's kind of, that's what I'd like to do. Um, that's kind of the, the priority for me. Um, some clients are easier than others to, to understand what they want. And you can always have the discovery call and the and the pricing call in one meeting. Um, it's been very difficult as it, hit, as it has been for everyone um, over the last you know year to 18 months in terms of meeting people. Um, you know, I, I attended one network session and I probably had two or three client meetings early 2020 and then everything was, was virtual. Um, so it's fine for me. I mean, I, I, I prefer face-to-face contact. I get a good rapport, you know, have some food and drink. It, it just makes things a lot easier. Um, Zoom is okay. It's fine. And, you know, I can hopefully impart my personality across on a call and, you know, people can see my wacky office in the background and things like that. But, um, I, I, I very much uh, prefer to meet people face to face. So um, trying to get people to have maybe two Zoom calls um, as opposed to maybe uh, a telephone call and, and a meeting um, or maybe the other way around, um, the dynamic was kind of mapped out for me. Um, and not everyone was keen to have two Zoom meetings. Somebody just, some people would just, you know, want, wanted a quicker decision. Um, and that was absolutely fine. Um, I would say that, you know, people that were, asking for price, you know, two minutes into an initial phone call. Um, I, I, I I don't make a habit of ever turning anyone away, um, but I always leave the pricing discussion to the end of, of whatever call I'm on. And I always make it so that if they are asking price, 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 um, I try and maybe price them upwards in terms of what I would normally price uh, an average client, just because I know that ideally they're probably not my ideal sort of client. So in order for me to take them on, it's going to have to be with my while um, from a financial point of view. So, um, I mean, in terms of, um, you know, the results that I've been getting, I would say that, you know, the the clients that I've had two phone calls with or two meetings with um, as part of that process, I've been able to attract higher fees. Um, and the reason for that is because they've wanted to engage for two meetings. Um, they can see the value in what I'm discussing quite often there's a lot of information to take on that first call and they're appreciative of the fact that they can go away, have a think and then come back with some more questions. Um, rather than the people that have maybe just one meeting primarily down to, to, to their uh, requirements, um, I, I perhaps don't get as as decent a fee from those sorts of clients. So that, that's probably what I found, um, certainly in the early days as well as I was you know, growing quite quickly. I'd like to drill down some specific res- results, but bef- uh, that you've been getting, but be because they are extraordinary. Some of the some of the results. But before we get into that, one other question that uh, I know that uh, I get from other people who are starting their accounting firm or bookkeeping businesses. The question I get is, is they ask me is, I'm starting out. How do I come up with a price? So, what was your approach? How did you when you were having those meetings when you were given the proposal? Uh, what was the basis on you coming up with a price? Um, yeah, I, I can't really put my finger on anything, to be honest. I mean, I, I, there are probably, I don't know, five or six, what I would call local, um, I'll call them competitors is, is, is not a great word, but other, uh, other, other firms providing similar services. Um, but I've, I've never once understood or, or reached out to them to say, look, you know, how much do you charge for uh, a personal tax return or how much do you charge for, for, for bookkeeping? I, I've always kind of gone down a path that says right what price would i be happy with to do this service of work for this client um and i i've i've kind of come up with um different sort of thresholds whereby you know if a client is a certain turnover um in terms of accounts and complexity of tax returns or maybe um you know volume of transactions in terms of bookkeeping um you know number of staff in terms of payroll so i've kind of got or, or back when I first started, I had sort of thresholds that kind of went through through each service. And I said, right, for my essentials tier, for my first package or my proposal, these are the prices that I would be happy with accepting for, for, for this service, for that level of service. 
And then my full my full tier and my premium tier, I would scale up by 30, 50% as, you know, very, very rough figures. Um, and um, that would be what, what I would propose to certainly initial um, people when they came across. And, you know, you, you asked me, well, what was that that essentials tier? What was that kind of base price? And th there was no real, real science behind it. Um, I just knew in my mind I had targets of how many clients do I need to have in order to pay the bills and, you know, to, to, to pay the mortgage? And what sort of average fee per month would each client need to have in order to, to, to make that happen? So I had three, six and 12 months targets for, for both of those kind of KPIs. And I knew that I needed roughly 15 clients at, say, I don't know, 150, 200 pounds a month on average for each client. And that's that's where I was I was getting to. And some clients were more, some clients were, were less. But in terms of kind of where my head was at, that was kind of the logic that I was then factoring into things like number of transactions for bookkeeping, and uh, level of turnover for, for, for tax returns in order to kind of, you know, square that circle. And then as time has gone on, my average fee has increased because I've become a bit more bullish and a bit more confident and my brand has increased and my social media is, uh, my social media exposure has increased. And I've just kind of like just pushed a little bit more, you know, every other month with similar clients that are still coming to me um, in terms of their business, in terms of their mindsets, you know, entrepreneurial people, startup businesses, you know, people that really kind of equate to my, my mindset. And I've gone, right, well, this is my portfolio and this is the average fee that I was charging about then. Um, and it's probably, probably 60, 70% higher on a monthly average now per client than it was back in March, 2020, for example. Wow, and you've said so many things there that, that are really impressive. So your 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 pricing has been partly set on the fact that you're very focused on your goals, where you need to, where you need to get to. You mentioned that you don't really price based on what the competitors are doing. You don't copy the competition like most people do. Uh, you recognise that everybody's different. That value pricing is a judgment, and so you give people a choice with the different options. And I love the fact that you've been also you keep testing and, and, and pushing the boundaries. So Neil, let's get into some some specific uh, stories, results, things that you've been um, some successes you've had with your pricing. Yeah, so um, there, there, there's one one uh, kind of example that I I'd, I'd like to share, um, and that was um, and it kind of follows the journey of of what I've done in terms of my marketing side as well. So um, I had uh, I had somebody reach out to me on my Facebook business page, sent me a message, um, and they, they they said they were looking to to start a limited company. Uh, they were in logistics. Um, they basically didn't know where to start, and they wanted a initial phone call. Um, so we had the initial phone call, um, went very well. Um, I asked how they found out about me. I mean, this was back in March, 2020. Um, so I'd, I'd not been around uh, an awful long time, um, but uh, they said that they saw um, a video on my Facebook business page and uh, it was an introductory video. And um, it was probably me, I was just trying to remember exactly what I was doing. I think I was walking around one of the fields near my house, with a big thick overcoat on, um, saying about me being an interesting accountant. It didn't look very interesting, um, I have you know, but um, he saw that video, he, he liked what I saw and, and he got in touch. And then, yeah, we, we had a, a second call. We went through some proposal options um, and he signed up for, I guess what at the time would have been my, my sort of my essential startup um, package, which was around about 150 pounds a month. Um, and this is before I was VAT registered as well. So that was that was the price to him. Um, and he wanted to do the bookkeeping, uh, and that was absolutely fine. He wasn't too keen on advisory because he was just starting out. So uh, again, it was quite a kind of a core compliance package that he got. Um, over time, um, you know, we grew as as businesses together. It was, it was quite nice that that, that, we, that we you know we could do that, and you know we we got quite friendly he's quite local to me and you know we had meetings and we went down the pub and I had a couple of beers and um albeit when, when they opened I think the first time that we had a beer was probably July time um when they reopened after the first lockdown um and then he, he came to me and said he wanted to start another business kind of similar in, in 
in kind of scale and scope to the first business, but a sl slightly different industry. So um, we, we set up with a second company and we basically mirrored the, the proposal into the second business. It was quite happy with the first one. And so we used that for the second one as well. Um, and then, yeah, you know, time went on, uh, Christmas, New Year came and then we were looking at uh, an annual renewal and, you know, him being quite new for me at that time, it was one of my first renewals that I did. Um, and I think we'd not long gone through some training on the academy that talked about client renewals and uh, the process and, and how you would basically uh, get, go into it eff effectively and, and how it would work. So I had uh, a Zoom meeting with him um, and I basically relayed three proposals for him. Um, I think the cheapest one was probably in the realm of 200 to 250 pounds a month. So, you know, a, about a third increase on what he was paying minimum. Um, but the, the the full and the premium tiers kind of brought in some, some bookkeeping services and brought in some advisory services. Um, and I showed him the the reporting system that I used at the time. Um, I said, look, we can, we can do a management accounts pack. We can get a profit and loss, we can get a balance sheet, we can get a cash flow. Um, we can look at some KPIs and his, his kind of eyes just sort of pinged open and he was kind of, you know, this is this is what you can provide based on the numbers that we're doing through zero. So yeah, absolutely, this is the information. It's not just gonna be a pack that I send you, but it will be a pack that I send you with a meeting or with um, a commentary email or, or something from me to describe those numbers. And he said, well, I can see how we've done over the last few months. I said, yep. He said, oh, we can maybe predict what taxes is likely to be before you. And I said, yep. Um, and it was kind of, you know, I I'd probably spent about half an hour with the system just showing him what I could do, what it could do. Um, and he was like, right, so what do I need to pay to basically get that system? I said, well, my premium package is, and I'm just trying to think off the top of my head, it's about 490, 490 pounds a month. And this was, I'm about registered now, so that was plus VAT. So we're talking about a, an increase from about 150 pounds to about 600 pounds a month. And he said, yes, straight away. He didn't even think about it. He said, does that include bookkeeping? So I said, yes. So I, I kind of upset, I, I you know, the, the fees weren't uh, comparing apples with apples, but I, I put in a couple of additional services. Some of the reporting, some of the advisory services I was already doing, you know, I was already giving him some advisory type services, albeit not a physical account, you know, management accounts pack, but um, I was already doing a lot of this work anyway. So from a time perspective, it wasn't an awful lot more time to physically then give him some tangible uh, reporting. Um, and so that was for the first business and the second business wasn't due for renewal until I think about September is when we set up that business. And I, I just said to him, I said, look, you know, would it make sense to bring the second business in line with the first one? So you've got the same service for both. And he said, yes, straight away. There's, there's kind of no, you know, no thought process about it whatsoever. He liked the service for the first one. So why wouldn't he want it for the second one as well? So I, I went from, you know, generating a, a fee for about 300 pounds per month for the two businesses to about 1200 pounds a month. Um, and, you know, we're still working on things now. He st st is still coming to me asking for additional stuff. Um, you know, his business has done very well throughout the pandemic, which, you know, I know a lot of um, businesses haven't. So, you know, we, we've kind of riffed off the fact that we've both done pretty well out of the pandemic. And, you know, he's he's just clamoring for more information. And I think that's in terms of a kind of a, a success story, you know, that, that goes from what I was prepared and, and confident to charge back a year, 18 months ago to the sorts of things that I'm doing now, especially in terms of an advisory space, getting clients on board, delivering the compliance work that they know needs to be done. And then after a period of time, diving in with the advisory and saying, look, this is what else I can do. And by that point, you've, you've built the rapport, you know, you know each other, you know each other's businesses. And more often than not, people have said yes to that. Extraordinary, that's a, a, a massive result. Uh, but I also know that you've had lots of other results and you've touched on there the, the, the advisory side and, and I wish we had time to, to drill down to that because I'm sure you've got some really uh, really key learning things to share with how you're doing the advisory and also how you're growing the firm. But I'm also conscious that uh, we, we need to perhaps draw things to a close. You've been very generous with your time. So I've got a couple more questions. So my penultimate question, Neil, is think about the 18 months that, that you've been running your practice. Uh, what would you, how would you describe the, 
uh, the, the successes, the results, whether that's, whether that's in terms of numbers, financial terms, or just how you feel about running your accounting firm. Because as you said at the outset, you were kind of thrust into it through redundancy, which must have been a scary time, particularly, as you said, with COVID then. But now just a short space further on. What's life like now? <coughs> um, excuse me. Um, I think, um, and yeah, I, I'm not too kind of privy to, to not share commercial. So, you know, when, when I, when I went full time, um, I think my recurring revenue was about seven or 800 pound a month. Uh, and, and that's probably being generous. Um, and I set myself, uh, I set myself a target of a hundred thousand pound turnover in year one. Um, and kind of looking back now, I, I, there was no, there's no reason for that. I just thought it was a, a nice number that I'd quite like to achieve. Um, and, uh, I, I managed to do that. Um, I managed to hit a hundred grand turnover by, by Christmas last year. Um, and then I said, well, that's, that's gone pretty well. So, so what, what kind of, what do I need to do this year to, to make me happy again? And, uh, I, I thought, well, let's, let's double it. No, just again, no, no kind of logic behind it. Let's, let's double it and see if we can hit 200 K this year. Um, and you know, at, at the moment, um, where are we end of, end of July? Um, I'm on track. Um, I managed to do what I did in the whole of 2020 um, by the beginning of June this year. So I, I'm a little bit kind of ahead of schedule. Um, so I, I guess in terms of, you know, the, the, the targets that I set myself, um, that's, that's kind of, that, that's one of the ones that, you know, because I mean, I, 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 I went into this for a reason. I'm passionate about helping people. Um, I, I always used to do extracurricular work in my day job. I always used to deal with marketing and IT and I just enjoy business. I just enjoy the operational side, the functional side of what businesses take and, you know, understanding businesses and getting people to smile because they've, they've saved tax or getting them to give me a hug because they now understand, you know, what, what sales channel they need to focus on. Cause you know, that's where they're getting their margins. Um, it is really humbling for me. Um, and you know, the, the, the money side of things is a byproduct, but I, I think in my mind, if you know, the, the more I can achieve these targets, then by default, the happier that I'm making people because I'm, I'm dealing with more clients and more clients are giving me amazing feedback and that's leading to referrals and, and more people viewing my content and, uh, and more clients. So it's kind of, it, it's that circle of, of, you know, if, if you do something good, um, then, then, then it will pay for itself, um, you know, multiple times over. Um, I, I, and, you know, to think that I've done all of this on my own as well, um, you know, I've not outsourced any work, um, uh, up until a few weeks ago, um, I've just taken on, uh, a new kitty as an apprentice and, um, that's going really well so far. Um, and that will hopefully open me up to having a bit more capacity to, to do with more clients and to do more advisory work. Um, and yeah, with, with you know the, the social media side of things exploding, um, new website coming, Facebook groups got about thirteen hundred people in. Um, so I just I, I still pinch myself, literally every week. Uh, I still pinch myself, um, and I take each each week and each month as it comes. Um, never take anything for granted. You know, coming from a position that I had nothing, and yeah, I've been very fortunate. Um, like I said, a, a lot of people in the pandemic haven't been. Um, I've had no holiday <laughs> and uh, I, I guess one of the, the barometers of success is that I'll be able to take some holiday uh, soon. Uh, we've got a very exciting trip to San Francisco uh, at the end of this year uh, to see my favorite band, which has come across at very short notice, but I'm now in a, in a financial and in a, you know, operational position to be able to say, Let, yeah, let's just drop everything in, in, in five months and let's go out there and experience that once in a lifetime uh, event. And I would have never, never been able to do that, you know, in my in my day job, uh, because I didn't have the money. I, I couldn't have got the time off work. I, it just would never have happened. I would have just put it under the carpet. But now, you know, something like that can happen, uh, and it's because of the last eighteen months. Um, so, you know, take nothing for granted, and, and hopefully, I can continue to grow and, you know, be a part of your amazing academy, Mark. That's, you know, I've met some really interesting people through it. Some peers, you know, people that are, are really, you know decent friends now whether they come from you know Canada or or South Africa um, and it's it's really cool that we're all in the same boat we're all trying to get to the same place so yeah 
That's what I would say for that. And what's extraordinary about uh, th those numbers, because I think back to when I started my firm in 96, I, I grew to just on over 200K in, in just over two years. But you've done it with only hiring one person very recently, whereas I did it by hiring a whole ton of people. And, and my bottom line was awful. But I'm guessing from what you're saying, your bottom line is actually pretty good. Uh, and I'm impressed that you're off to go to San Francisco. You'll love that. It's one of my favourite places. Been there many times over the last few years. So if you want any tips on where to go and visit, uh, just shout out and I'll, I'll yes, give please. you some thoughts. <laughs> yep. Okay. I'll do it. So my final question, uh, uh, you've shared so much, but if we could just wrap up by just if, Neil, you could share, what would be three tips? What If you were to give some advice to somebody watching, what would those three tips be? Um, I guess if, if somebody is, is looking to start their, their accountancy business or, or have done already, um, I think tip number one would be to join Mark Wickersham's Value Pricing Academy um, because, you know, without without wanting to, you know, to be too blushing, um, it, it has, it's changed my life in terms of what I perhaps would have done without it. Um, and who knows what I would have done without it, but, you know, the, the, the core principles, the structure, the content, um, and Mark as a sounding board, you know, all of that has just been inspirational. And, and I have no doubt it. I, I hopefully would have got to this point without Mark, but it would have taken me months and years more. Um, so definitely that, that would be thing one. Um, thing two would be to, to share a network. And again, it's been difficult um, the last year, 18 months, but I'm quite active on social media and I've managed to network lots of times um, with people on Facebook, on LinkedIn, um, you know, not just clients, but, but other peers, you know, people in another industry that are new business owners as well. Um, I've been very fortunate to have spoken at a couple of really large accountancy conferences. And that's just due to the fact that I've been a, a nuisance. I've been a pest on social media and I've, I've asked to have discussions with people and I've asked to, you know, I've asked to be involved in things, you know, whether it be, uh, a webinar or a conference or or anything, uh, a blog or or whatever. Um, so yeah, kind of networking and, and getting your, getting your name out there as much as possible um, is definitely um, the second thing that I would say. And maybe the third one and, and possibly the most important one for me um, is just be yourself. Um, I see so much online nowadays where people are trying to conform to to stereotypes and you know they're they're producing. In really informative um, videos and and content around being an accountancy business and trying to help their clients, but it comes across as really dry. Um, and I am I am absolutely no expert, but what I've tried to do with with my content is is overlay it with my personality. And you know, there's no like I said before, there's no green screen behind me. It's it's my office that's probably a mess, but it shows my character, my personality, and you know, my live videos on Facebook. Um, you know, if it's after a sweaty run or if it's, you know, something informative about something to do with VAT or something to do with the system, um, the finding that balance has come quite natural to me. Um, a, because I'm quite active on social media anyway, but B, I've, I've operated like this within a career for the last 12, 13, 14 years. I've not changed who I am. I've just been myself. So I think that that, that for me would probably be the most important one. Uh, I think clients can see through when you're looking to sell them something. Well, they, they can see through when you're trying to get something across, but it might it might not have the same impact. It might be a little bit boring. They might drop off. Um, but by being yourself and and kind of giving that personality out, I think absolutely that that, that has helped me 100 percent to to kind of gain the following and and, and gain the the exposure that I've I've fortunately been you know I've managed to get. Amazing three tips, and I was just reflecting on those and, and that last point or the last pair of points. I know we did a session, uh, you did a session, a longer session than this for my audience, where one of the things that came out was this whole thing about your personality, which is which is awesome that uh, that, that you let that flow through. And and it was also, I mean, very kind of you with, with tip number one, but one of the things I do know about you is that you, are, you always show up to the live sessions. You are always continually learning. And I think that is so, so important, whether it's learning from me or, or somebody else. I think that the, 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 the world's changing so fast, we cannot stand still and we've got to learn new skills. And you are brilliant at that, Neil. 
So thank you so much for coming along. Thank you for sharing so many amazing things. Your journey is incredible. I know that we'll probably catch up again as I find out what you're doing next year because it'll keep going, I'm sure. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much, Neil. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Goodbye for now. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. In that interview with Neil, we focused on really on the pricing side of things. But there's so much more that he's doing, which is incredible, which you probably got a little bit of a, an insight during the course of that interview. One of the things he talked about at the end is his personality, and he really lets that shine. And so I caught up with him a few months back, and what I'll do is I'll give you a link to that particular video if you want to dive into some other aspects of Neil's story. I think we filmed that roughly after his first year in practice. Uh, and I knew then this is an extraordinary accountant doing extraordinary things. Uh, he talks a bit about what he's doing from a marketing point of view, how he's growing his accounting firm. So if you've enjoyed this video, just let me know by just clicking the, uh, the thumbs up, the like button. Yeah, let me have a comment in your comments, any questions you've got. And I'll also put in the some links below if you want some additional resources. But also go and check out that other interview with Neil. It's, it's extraordinary, the stuff that he's doing. Goodbye for now.